Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I first want to say thank you for being here this morning because I know you have choices that pull on your time in a lot of different directions. And I also want to acknowledge that we, none of us would be here this morning if it wasn't for this man and the team that he's assembled. I promise you, I get goosebumps saying this, God has a castle in store for you. And I'm thrilled to be your friend. So would you give Jeffrey a round of applause, please? Gosh, I don't usually get emotional just starting. Good morning. <laughs> In the next 40 minutes, I'm going to challenge you to make a new decision that can change your career, change your family, change your business, if you'll make the right decision, which you will conclude, which I'll share with you in 40 minutes. So what I'm going to share with you this morning is all the places I've been in corporate America, and for the last 11 or 12 years, I've been an independent business consultant working with small to medium-sized businesses. Anywhere from 10 to 500 employees is kind of the definition of that size. So I'm thrilled to be here this morning. I find most business people, most of you, are looking for solutions to answers. How to win in this economy. How to have an edge. And so that's what we're going to share with you this morning. Because somebody changed the rules and didn't ask your opinion. In the last couple years, there has become a talent crisis in Michigan and in the United States. Unemployment is down to a point where almost everybody who wants to work in Michigan, I'm going to speak mostly about Michigan, almost everybody's working. All the A and B performers are already working. And so it does beg the question, if you're going to create a business that will grow at the pace of Jeffrey's business. I have the privilege, like others, of being part of the team that's developing the leadership and the culture at Structure Tech. I do love that I get a chance to serve on the board here, but they're growing at a pace of 20% a year. And quite honestly, trying to control the growth. Is that true, Jeffrey? I mean, they want to grow, but if you grow without the right model in place, you will magnify the chaos. And I'm going to show with you the model that I've used to coach businesses to become the business coach of the year in North America four years in a row out of 450 coaches. I'm going to share with you the model that I use to be successful that you can use in your business. Quick needs assessment. How many of you um, are entrepreneurs and you own your own company? Raise your hand, just so I know who's here. Okay, maybe 25%. And how many of you are employees in somebody else's company, so you're an employee of some sort. And how many of you will not raise your hand no matter what question I ask? <laughs> okay, and you're sitting together, how perfect. <clears throat> Everything that Jeffrey just shared is in my latest book that came out, which Jeffrey is in the book as an endorsement of the book, because I believe the answer going forward is leadership. And as some of you may know that have been to some of these events before, those of us that have the privilege of being asked to speak are asked to weave into our presentation our testimony about our relationship with God. And so today, I'm going to talk to you about my relationship with God. I'm going to talk to you about your relationship with God. And I'm going to challenge your thinking a little bit. Because that's what I do and it's who I am. Nobody ever calls me and says, John, I'd like you to work with me or a member of my management team or so on. And we just like the way things are going. Will you just keep it going the same way? I don't ever get those phone calls. How many of you have seen the TV show The Prophet? Marcus Lemonis on Tuesday night, CNBC. Um, with a couple exceptions, it's a good business show to watch if you don't already. So I've put my 30 years of doing this in corporate America and entrepreneurship inside the book because I believe that my calling is to help people grow and learn and serve their family, their communities, serve the Lord, and serve the environment of people they touch. And so today I'd like you to be thinking about what's your calling? What do you really, good? there's a lot of things I'm not good at, you can ask my wife. But there's a few things that I'm really good at 
and developing talent and helping organizations win. I just love, Jer Jeffrey knows this, they said, when they asked me to speak here, because I've already spoken at this in Southfield, and, and I said, what would you like me to speak? Do the same thing, John, people loved it. I want to challenge you to think about what are you really good at and how can you improve that scope? He's already recognized it, but Dan, would you just wave the video guy in the back, the, back there? If you're not using video to grow your business, and there's probably, what Dan, 10 or 20 ways that business owners can use video in a variety of ways to grow their business, you ought to talk to Dan before you leave. Because he donates his time to help this Christian organization. Right here in front of us, he's already been recognized as Nick. Nick donates his time. So when you leave here today as an IT expert, so if your IT infrastructure and support isn't fabulous, you ought to get his card. He's right here in front of me. Because he donates. So the question is, when we look at your brand, when God looks at your brand, when God looks at your resume, when it's your day to leave this earth, what's your resume going to look like? Who are you hanging out with? It's such a privilege to be on the board of this organization and keep talking about how we can expand the outreach. And so one of the ways that I enjoy weaving in my testimony into my presentation is I love to lead by example. And so by example, I'm trying to create ways every day to help this organization grow so that next time we have one of these, we don't fit in this room. Wouldn't that be fabulous? Wouldn't that be an incredible networking opportunity? And by the way, you ought to network when you come to these. Meet other Christians in the room. You really should. Some of you come in and sit down. Some of you didn't bring business cards. So here's what I see when I go into most businesses, when I get a phone call. Most of them do not have a plan to grow their business. Number two, there's a shortage of the right talent. How many of you have heard the saying, practice makes perfect? No, it doesn't. The right practice makes perfect. I'm a mediocre golfer. I can go hit a lot of balls on the driving range and I can practice a lot. I'm still a mediocre golfer until I get somebody to help me know how to improve and what slight adjustment do I need to make. If you know anything at all about golf, you'll know that how you hold the club is really important. <coughs> Not just holding the club. See, if I hand you a club, you would know which end to hold in your hand and you would kind of sort of look like a golfer but a sixteenth, of an a sixteenth of an inch of an adjustment of your left hand will decide how big a fade and how big a slice you have in your golf game. All the little adjustments. So I'm gonna share with you the formula to grow your business and have more success so the business will run without you and how to advance your career. But you have to be willing to pay attention to the little adjustments you need to make. I find inconsistent execution. According to Harvard Business Review, the number one reason CEOs are terminated in America for five years in a row is inability to execute. Failure to execute consistently. So if you don't have a good plan, you don't have the right talent, and you can't execute, you are running the risk of going out of business. Or somebody buying you, or taking over, or somebody putting two companies together and dominating your place, your marketplace. In order to fit this presentation in 45 minutes, we've given you a handout that has a bunch of the research that I've pulled together that will prove to you that great talent gives you an edge to execute. So there's a lot of research in there that ought to get your attention and help understand the bottom line impact of talent. I find average leadership talent in most organizations, we'll talk about that in just a moment, that the discipline for systems, I've owned a franchise in my lifetime. One of the things I do when I coach my business owners, I've worked with franchisors and I've worked with franchisees, is that I have helped put systems and processes in place so that the business will run more consistently, just like a McDonald's, for example. McDonald's, how many of you go to McDonald's because they have the best food that you've ever eaten? Look around the room, the answer is none but they are consistent. You can get the same high calorie, high fat Big Mac with the exact same number of pickles anywhere in the world. And I've done it. It's the same in Germany as it is in Plymouth, Michigan. 
because they're consistent and the company can be run with 16 year olds who don't make their bed in the morning and their supervisor is a 65 year old who's had to come back to work because their 401k is in the tank. Running multi-billion dollar operations effectively if they can read and follow the process. Unpredictable profits is another something I see. The business will not run without the CEO or the president of the company. Companies are not differentiating themselves. Leadership development is not a business priority. How many of you have heard the saying, talent is my greatest asset, people are my greatest asset? And when a CEO says that to me, I just have a hard time at the beginning of a relationship saying, no, it's not. Yes, it is, John. Really? Show me your budget. Prove it. And they can't. Their budget for developing people, at best, is tiny. In most organizations, it's not even a line item. Oh, we do some training. See, in today's business climate, one of the things you need to know is there is no guarantee about tomorrow. None. Zero. Service is average at best. How many of you, by show of hands, in the southwestern part of Michigan, can name two companies that are extraordinary, not good, extraordinary at their service model. Who can raise their hand because you know two? Okay, one guy kind of going like this. What if your company's differentiator was service? The way you take care of today's customers and tomorrow's customers. Because I find in most businesses, service in America is about average at best. I've even gone so far as to say, I think service in a good part of America sucks. I really do. Uh, it's an average at best. We go to the same five or six restaurants all the time. And we get the same food. It's pretty predictable. We'll get primarily the same dishes, the service, the price, the cleanliness. But it's never extraordinary. I just don't get extraordinary very often. What if your company designed a culture to be extraordinary at what you do when it comes to your interactions with the customer? We'll talk more about that in a moment. Cultures are not by design. All of you have a culture where you work. All of you have a culture in your family. The question is, is it the way you would design it? And alignment is an issue. I rarely find that alignment in most organizations that people can tell me the business priorities of the business. So, look at the words. The market you're in, the morale, what the front lobby looks like, policies in the business, the logo of the company, what the website looks like, their community involvement, turnover, training, recruiting, values, onboard. Who's responsible for all that stuff in your business? Leaders are. Leaders are responsible. There is no part of your business, in my opinion, and I've been in probably 50 of the greatest companies in the world, there's nothing about that business that isn't the direct reflection of decisions made by people in decision-making positions. We tend to call those people leaders. So whatever's good or bad about your company, the way people dress, what the lobby looks like, how clean the floor is, what color the walls are, is there a light bulb out somewhere? That's all a reflection of how leaders create a culture that creates that experience for customers. So when I talk to you about how to grow your business and how to improve your career, I want you to start thinking about the word leadership and how are we developing leaders? How are you developing yourself to be a better leader? And so while I'm on the subject, one of the things I said that I demonstrate my relationship with God by firsthand experience versus just telling you about it, I like to act, the act. One of the things I would ask you to do, if you'd like to improve your resume with the Lord, I'd like to ask you to think about how many people do you invite to come to these breakfasts? I mean, really. I'll bet each one of you knows 25 people that by sending an email and making a three-minute phone call, you could have a table all by yourself. You don't have to buy their seat. Just invite them to come here and join and network. This place could have 150 people next time if you would just take the initiative to contribute to the mission of this organization. Just invite people to come. You'll be out of here by 9.05. So I would ask you to think about how you could help this organization. And bringing a guest or two or five would be a fun way to do that. 
So why is there a leadership drought in America? The answer is because most leaders in most organizations don't understand the single biggest decision you can make in your organization is to strategically develop a master plan to develop your entire leadership team, including frontline supervisors, team leaders, project managers. My wife's a nurse manager. Most organizations do not have a process in place to develop leadership talent. So in the book, there's a chapter that talks about this picture. In my experiences, there are a handful of executives, a handful of CEOs, who are the best in their industry consistently. There are a percentage of people working at improving and, and striving to get there. And about seven out of 10 people I meet, CEOs of companies, wouldn't let us work with them for free. They're arrogant, they think they know what they're doing, they think they can grow their business without professional help. And John, what do you know about running a dry cleaning business? Nothing. What do you know about running a Harley Davidson dealership? Never been in one. I've had two motorcycles, but they weren't Harleys. See, 70% or more of CEOs in this room will not go outside and find expert help in areas that they're not experts in. And so some parts of your business will suffer because of that. I was at a breakfast meeting earlier this week with the president of Comerica Bank speaking, and it was a breakfast meeting, about 100 people in the room, celebrating businesses in Michigan that have hit the 100-year anniversary mark. And he shared some nuggets about what did they do during 07 and 08 and 09. When everybody else was struggling, when everybody else was cutting travel, cutting training, laying people off, just trying to survive, what did those companies do? You know one of his bullet points, one of his key messages that morning? Those companies were investing in technology and investing in people when others were cutting back. So I'd like you to think about how does your organization approach that. So I find most CEOs have three options. Either tolerate, tolerate the way your business is running today, start developing the talent you have, or go out and buy new talent. We're about to add, I think, a new board member to our CBRT board. Her name is Janice. She works with Express Employment. She couldn't be here with us this morning. She, her organization specializes, and there are others, that specialize in helping you have a better hiring and selection process. It's not a strength of most people in this room, has been my experience. So you, you have three choices. This picture is in your handout. You can tolerate the way your business is running today because it's not going to get better, or you can develop the talent you have, begin to develop a plan, or go out and buy new talent. Here's the business model that I use to grow all businesses that I work with. Number one, we're going to spend a lot of energy on the leadership, on how you create a customer experience, on systems and process, and on talent. And the target in all of that is to create a culture where people love coming to work every day. And that's a pretty special place because those places will take talent from your companies. People will leave mediocre companies with a mediocre culture in today's society and go to work for great companies. And who, quick question, somebody answer, and who determines the culture of a company? Leadership, Leadership. good answer. So let's talk about how to build an engagement culture. I've given you a bunch of statistics and a bunch of research. I'm a huge nut about research. So your handout is filled with research. But this one slide kind of summarizes it all. If you can create one of those kind of cultures, and you can, the question is, will you? There are business reasons you need to pay attention to your culture. And all this is in your handout. About three in 10 workers, according to a study by Gallup, are truly engaged, which means about 70% of your workforce is not. Some are retired, they just haven't told you yet. 
So let's talk about the word leadership for a moment. How many of you have read the book, it's quite a few years old now, Good to Great? I bet many have. So it was a research project by Jim Collins and his crew, and they went out and studied great companies that outperformed their competition for long periods of time. What were those great companies doing? And then right after they published the book, some started to decline. Isn't that interesting? They had been successful for a decade, and they got a story written about them, and some of them began, started to decline. In fact, a few years later, one or two of them didn't exist. Great companies, Fortune 500 companies. There were about 40 major bank systems here in Michigan in 1990. Today there are eight, according to the president of Comerica. Right after those companies started to decline, about three years later, they went out and did another research project. Because all of us are smarter after the fact, right? So what, were the, what happened to those great companies? And here's one of the findings in the book. You ought to read this one too. Because this one might even be more revealing than the first one. And look at one of the key findings. They were great, so let's assume you are. And then they started to decline quickly. What happened? A warning sign, according to his team, in the newest book, was they started not paying attention to what are the key seats in the company and are they filled with the right people today and in the future. And if you own a business that's got six employees or 60 or 600, this point is still the right point for you to pay attention to. Do you have the right talent in the right seats? The challenge with that PowerPoint slide is that when I ask people, if I pointed at somebody and asked you to stand up, most people cannot tell me what are the key seats in your company. So how would you possibly know if they're filled with the right people if you don't even know where the seats are? Jeffrey's done as much work or more than most CEOs in the state of Michigan on this slide because every day he thinks about the future and do I have the right talent? And every day he's looking. I heard him ask somebody at the table this morning about an opportunity. Because he's always looking for great talent. If we took the time this morning, and we would not, I would ask you, how many A performers do you have in your leadership team? How many people are above average? How many people come to work, do their job, and go home? And how many should, quite honestly, you be getting rid of or something different? And when I do this, I've done this to probably 15,000 people in audiences. God is speaking. He wants me to emphasize this slide. He made a phone go off. Here's what the answers are. This is staggeringly embarrassing. And you can sit there and tell me this is not true for your company. And every once in a while it's true. But here's what happens. This number is almost always, I do this for a living. This number is almost always the same as this number. Give or take one or two. I did, how many of you have heard of the Vistage organization? I speak at some of their events around the Michigan. It's another CEO organization bringing people together. We did this exercise. I didn't show them this slide. And here's the flip chart from the exercise. Look at this. By the way, they were on the western side of Michigan. This is 70%. If 70% of your talent is average or below, you don't have a chance to win. Could I be any more direct? You don't have a chance. Your only way to keep thriving is spend a lot of money on marketing. That's your only prayer. If seven out of 10 of your employees are average or worse, See, I think this is a real leadership issue. In fact, this whole slide's a leadership issue. But it begs the question, who are the supervisors and managers of these employees? And why are they still on the payroll? Because let me be really clear. Your really best employees do not like working with these people. Do you know that most people like when these people call in sick? They'd rather not be there. They would prefer to not have them show up at all. And you have one or two in your company, and you know who I'm talking about. In fact, what's kind of scary is most people in your company know who they are. You just haven't done anything about it. 
those of you that are CEOs and presidents of companies. So here's a quick pop quiz for you. What do all these people have in common? Other than the fact that they're all men. Anybody want to guess? Speak up. They're all leaders. I'm sorry? Leadership ability. Thank you. She's paying attention. Top of their game. Probably Hall of Fame. Yes. And they all have coaches. Oh, I like you. <laughs> Remind me to give that man one of the books. I want, they're all high performers, probably all going to be in the Hall of Fame. And they were all cut, fired, re-signed, or traded. Because some leader had the courage to say, you don't have what we need going forward. Can you imagine trading Wayne Gretzky? Can you imagine being the GM and you just traded Miguel Cabrera to the Tigers a few years ago? Thank you very much. <laughs> really? You've got some people, you have leaders that need to make some new decisions around the talent in your company if you want to survive. We did a study. You've got the entire summary of the study in page two in the handout. This is one of the slides. But isn't this telling? What percentage of your entire management team would you hire as top performers? We surveyed 33,000 executives in America. And 36% of, of that 33,000 said, I would rehire less than half of my management team. That's kind of sad. So all right, so you're either going to fire them all or start to develop them with a plan. Here's one of the other ones. I'm only going to show you two. I believe there are 11 of them on page two in your PowerPoint. What percentage of your organization executes its plan of top priorities consistently? Forty percent said less than half. Hmm, isn't that interesting? I'll give a book to somebody who's willing to let me be a test case with them. Who's an employee in a company? And you can tell me, listen carefully. If you raise your hand, I'll call on you. You and your boss, it's now April. We're a third of the way through the year. You should know what your top three or four measurable priorities are that you're responsible for delivering in your company. You and your boss have talked about it. You have it in writing at your desk. Who would say, I can, say, I can tell you my three, John. Anybody in the room? I'll give you one of my books. She's thinking about it. Yes, sir. Now listen to my question before you open your mouth. Stand up. Go ahead. What's your first name? Sean. Sean, we're going to have a little fun together in a short time. So, Sean, you and your boss, is your boss here? No. Whew, good. <laughs> you and your boss have discussed your top three priorities. You can tell us what they are, and they're measurable. So don't just say improve something. They've got to be measurable. And you have it in writing at your desk. Before you say anything, is there anybody else who can say yes? Wow, four people. I've never had four in an audience before. Not bad. Four out of 75. So let's do a little test. Tell us your three priorities and the measure that goes with each one of them in, in one sentence each. They help us tickets, uh, so I measure them every two weeks. And what's the goal? So the goal is to keep track of the time issues. So it's keep track. Yeah. So, so you can walk around and ask people how you're doing? Depending on how many come in, so I'm at like 30 tickets. Okay, so what's the goal? To improve it by what? Do you have a goal? To improve the... the uh, Keeping track, by the way, is an activity. Right. What's the goal? By how much? You can sit down now. <laughs> Thank you. I will give you a book in a moment. Karen, would you hand him one of the books, please? See, most of you can't. Not really. Thank you. Yeah. Would you hand that to him, please? How do you expect to win if employees in your organization don't know what's expected of them in measurable terms? How do you give them performance feedback? Well, I'm tracking. I can walk around and ask people, how you doing? I can say that's tracking. Boss, I did a great job. You owe me a big bonus. I'm tracking. The boss says, great. Give that 4% increase. I'm hoping you have a nugget or two go off today that will change how you think about the future of your business. And there's a little tan card in front of you that's a feedback form if you want to talk to me after today. Let's talk about the customer real quick. I've got to speed up. How would you rate service in America? We've already covered that. On balance, it's not very good. If you like to read, you need to read this book. The Customer Experience Revolution by Jeffrey Bean. 
Jeffrey's a friend of mine out in California. They wrote a book, and the J.D. Powers organization asked them to present the findings of their research at their national conference. So the book is about the customer experience, before the purchase, during the purchase or experience, and after the experience. And we know from research that people will pay for great service. Some of you go get your hair done at a certain place or restaurants at a certain place, and it may not be the cheapest. We know with facts, what if you could create a better customer experience if you did what they paid you to do and what if you took care of all their outside outsourcing IT support and you did it for every one of them, but what if in addition to doing what they pay you to do, you do that and fill in the blank. So whether it's Zappos or Disney or Nordstrom's or some company that you think is one of the great companies, what if your company knew the answer for filling in the blank? What if you did more than what they just pay you to do? What if the chef in one of those restaurants that we went, walked out to walked out because he knows we're there almost every other Friday and says, Mr. Langford, you and your life, we're about to add a new appetizer to the menu. Would you mind trying it? It's on the house and I'd, I'd really love your feedback. <laughs> I'd be like shot. I'd even have a story to tell you, except I don't have any stories to tell you. And we go to some of the nicer restaurants. They're not extraordinary, but they're not Applebee's. And I do like Applebee's, by the way. Systems. Here's a guy who knows something about winning. Would you agree? If you don't know who he is, you ought to. I love studying people that win. Just won his 11th national championship. Coaching women's basketball at UConn. Last year, when they won the national championship, they're coming off the floor and, bless their hearts, some female announcer who's covering the game, runs up to one of the girls and says, how do you do it? And the girl's sweating like crazy. She's all excited and confetti's coming down. And the reporter sticks a microphone in front of her mouth and says, how do you do it? You must practice like unbelievable until you get it right. And the girl who's full of jubilation and just cheering and sweating, all of a sudden the girl went, no, we don't. And stopped the report. No, that's not how we practice. We don't practice till we get it right. We practice until you can no longer ever do it wrong. How do you practice in your organization? How do you coach and ask people for expectations? We don't practice till we get it right. We practice until you can never do it wrong. That's pretty high expectations. Systems deliver quality and speed and consistency. I can, I can do a whole workshop on systems and process in your company. Let's talk about talent for a moment. When you read the ingredients of the handout I've given you, when you highlight some of the components of that, um, you will think differently about the future of your company. Let's talk about talent for a moment. Yes, the right talent really matters. I was asked to speak at the Broad School of Management at Michigan State a few months back, and they asked me to speak on the subject of how to attract and retain millennials. By the year 2020, half of all of your companies will be millennials. Isn't it interesting that in sports, the great teams seem to always win? Bill Belichick, others, University of Alabama, Nick Saban, Judd, uh, um, the coach at Michigan State, they just seem to win. In that Super Bowl game, and those two teams have been to the Super Bowl a lot, 39 players on their rosters weren't even drafted. How do they take people that nobody else wants and create a winning team? What do they know about developing talent? What does Nick Saban know at Alabama? I don't know. What did Bobby Knight know when he was here? And other great coaches. Can talent be developed? Yes. You cannot win with average talent. There's a whole set of truths in the book. I believe there are 18 of them. There's a whole chapter. One of them is you cannot win with average talent. Remember the slide 15 minutes ago? High performers do not like working with average performers or worse. So let me give you the solutions. I've got 
just a few minutes left. Let me walk you through. Okay, John, I, you got my attention. What do I do with this? First, remember I told you at the beginning of our conversation, there's a decision you need to make about the future of your career and the future of your company. This is that decision. You need to make developing talent a business priority. Whether you call me or somebody else, doesn't matter. You need to make developing leaders a business priority, perhaps above everything else. You'd have a hard time arguing with me about what other line item in your budget is more important than developing your leadership talent. Number two, develop a master plan. I coach no companies unless they have a plan. So the very first thing we do is develop a plan for what are we gonna do with your business in the next three to five years. Tell me the kind of lifestyle you wanna have, because almost all of the clients we work with are either family-owned businesses or entrepreneurs. Tell me the kind of lifestyle you wanna have in five years, and I'll help you build a business that'll give it to you. And I've showed you the model that I used to do that. Number three. Create a steering committee. Create some sort of a small group of really positive people. This all, now, I'm showing you what to do. I don't have time in 45 minutes to say, and here's how you do it. But you need to have a committee of people. Who's the president of a company in here? Somebody raise their hand. CEO. Yes, sir. What's your first name? Blair. I'm sorry? Blair. Blair. So my experience would say, Blair, I don't want you to lead the culture change in your committee. You play an important role but I want to get a small group of people to lead that charge. I want to create a SWAT team. I want to create a team of people that when they speak, and it could be a nurse on the floor on the afternoon shift, when these seven or eight people speak, people listen, because they have respect in the organization and they always contribute at a high level. And they bring a great attitude to work every day. Some of you might have a hard time finding eight of those. You need to do an assessment of your management team. If we're going to develop your leadership team, we need to know, do you have the right leaders to be developed? And in most, answer, most companies, the answer is usually we have some work to do. So if this were an assessment that we might use, and you create some acceptable ranges, the blue is, here's what this job needs to be a top performer, and we assess people that are in the job against it, and then we plot the scores, Seven, if the range is five to eight, that's a great score. This person overall scored a 94% match. Not 93, not 95. A 94% match to the perfect candidate for that job. Imagine if your entire management team had the right person with the right skills and experience in the job. Should you be measuring your culture? Absolutely. If I could ask your employees, what is it like to work in your company, Blair? It'd be valuable to know. Here's a report. Blair, I'm picking on you because now I know your name. Imagine this is Blair's report. Here it is. We've asked all his employees, and here's what they said. Now, would that be useful data for Blair to have when he thinks about there's a, a recruiting and retention crisis in Michigan? Would that be valuable for him, his information, yes or no? Of course it would. Now, what do you do with the results? Well, that's a whole other chapter to talk about. But wouldn't that be valuable to know? All of my great clients do this. And it's not very expensive. We create a cadence of meetings. It starts with a planning session. We begin to create the priorities of the business right down to and including sharing it with every employee. And then in some companies, we've added the huddle on the back end of the business. How many of you know what a huddle is? Anybody in the room? Some hands? Good, good. Do you do it in your companies? Is it good? Is it valuable? Absolutely. It's very valuable. Now you might say, well, John, I got people all over the country and Jeff's put, Jeffrey's putting people on jets and moving people around and doing things. How can we do a huddle? Well, if we can do it at Oakwood Healthcare and deliver babies and run the ERs, not skip a beat, and do surgeries, and run the hospitals, plural, and all the satellite locations, if we can do it there, trust me, we can figure out how to do it in Blair's company. 
one of the greatest retention strategies there is when you learn to do it properly. It takes eight minutes at the beginning of every shift. Now, if you're, if you're Blair and you're looking at all these days, John, you really expect me to do this? John, I got a business to run. When you add all that up, that's about 5% of Blair's time. Blair and his executive team, his management team, his key leaders. I could change the financial performance of his business if their key leaders would follow that rhythm of meetings. Because communication soars. Accountability soars. People owning what are they responsible for soars. Somebody at today's huddle mentions that my daughter had a baby yesterday. And we didn't know that. I saw at one huddle, one lady loves to farm. She brought in a basket of tomatoes for everybody in her huddle. And it was her turn to share something positive. She gave everybody a basket of tomatoes. And you conduct the entire meeting standing up in eight minutes. Most of you are not capable of running an eight-minute meeting. You're not. But we can teach you how. <clears throat> Here's what an agenda might look like. Each person around the table, standing up. You don't sit down. What's one priority you have for the day? What's one metric, one metric that you're working on today? What's one, one problem or issue? You go around the room. You just keep going around the circle and end with something positive. Sometimes everybody has one. Sometimes just one person has one. Might be we landed a new big contract yesterday. <clears throat> Most companies I go in, this is being filmed, so I have to be careful. <clears throat> Most companies I go into do not have a good accountability system. In fact, most of them, it's a joke. It's an HR task where once a year I got to fill out some forms. But I'm, what a great tool to have. Sir, what was your name again that's getting the free book? Sean. Sean. At the beginning of the year, Sean, how many people in your company approximately, full time, part time? Uh, about 80. 80. Wouldn't it be cool if all 80 employees? after the company has set the business priorities for the year, that all 80 employees, one at a time, get to know what's expected of them. At the end of the year, I'm, so this happens in January, February, at the end of the year, they have a year in review, and for 11 months in between, they get periodic coaching and feedback from a manager who's really well-trained. Do you think that would help your retention for every employee to know what's expected of them, to get, to get a good, fair, honest review at the end of the year, and get great feedback throughout the year. <clears throat> These are just examples of tools that we use to give people, give leaders feedback on their performance. 360 works sometimes, the employee engagement survey that I just held up the report, that's a form of feedback. In some organizations, we create a scorecard based on some important key performance indicators for managers. Here's a slide I want you to remember. I'm going to slow down for a second, only for a second. Your nine talent management systems can reinvent your company. So I want you to think about the word process and system. How does your company currently do recruiting? What's your recruiting system? What is your hiring and selection system? What is your onboarding system? How do you train and develop people once you have them? What is your accountability system? All of these will help you attract and retain great talent. But you can't do one or two of them. It's a formula. How well do you develop leaders? How do you promote people in your organization? When my wife left work on a Friday a few years ago as a nurse, came in on Monday, and she was a nurse manager. Karen, is that a true story, yes or no? That's not a very good promoting talent system. She used to go to lunch with these people, now she's their manager. That's how most companies do it. Trust me, that is not a best-in-class process how you compensate people, and how you measure your culture. I could work in your company for a year just on these nine talent management systems. This can reinvent your company. Some of you will create some sort of corporate university model. Jeffrey is really working hard at that right now and has been for a few years. But even at breakfast this morning, he's talking about how we improve it. Uh, here's a book you need to read. So, Jeffrey, I'm going as fast as I can. Jim Collins wrote Good to Great. This was a study of Fortune 500 companies. This guy wrote a book, Keith McFarlane, and he went out and did research on companies your size. 
What were the great ones doing? He studied the 5,000 fastest growing companies in America and wrote a book about what are they doing, but they were all small to medium sized companies. One of the findings in the book is people like you used outside experts better than their competition and outperformed them in profit by three to one over a 10 year period. Is profit an important word, yes or no? <laughs> Absolutely. You ought to read this book, The Breakthrough Company by Keith McFarland. Go ahead and read it, even though the colors look like Ohio State. Here's the accountability system. If you ask Jack Welch, if you study his stock prices over a 20 year period of him being CEO, he said, if I can only measure three things, one of them is profit, one of them is employee engagement, employee satisfaction. This is the process that I use to coach all my clients around how to put a better accountability system in your organization. Live the values, deliver the results, and that development should not be optional in your company. That's a really simplified version of the accountability system we use. So here's my offer to you. On the little tan card in front of you, grab it and print your name. And get out your telephone. Print your name so I can read it. <laughs> and if you'd like to speak to me, check a box or two down below. While you're doing that, look up. Get your phone out and send me a text. And I'll show you why. The study of those 33,000 executives, one of my clients was a printing company in St. Louis. So they took my white paper and turned it into a magazine. I'll have this emailed in your inbox before you stand up if you send me a text to that number right now. Only put your name and your email address. That's all I want. Don't say, hi, John. Don't say anything else. Your name and your email address. Text it to that number, and this will be in your inbox in less than 60 seconds. So I'll just leave this screen up here. We're getting ready to come to a close in just a moment. Here's the last thought I'd like you to have, please. I am particularly proud. I work every day at being a better husband, being a better father to my daughter, being a better business leader. But when in the business world, I have found my calling to help demonstrate and spread the word of Jesus Christ. I love getting to stand in front of you as an example of how to help provide information to people, maybe inspire people to take an action. Maybe it's inspire you to bring somebody to the next one or get a whole table and bring five of your customers or your vendors. I'm proud of the resume I have built so far with the Lord. It's not as good as I'd like it to be, and I make my share of mistakes. You can ask my wife, she'll tell you. But I work every day at being better. And I would ask you to find a way to hang out and support Christians in this room, to come to the events. Jeffrey's planning a five-year gala. You've got to get a table because that's contributing in a small way to help tell people that there is a better future for all of us in this room. So on behalf of Jeffrey and the CBRT, thank you for being here today. Thank you for watching this presentation. Perhaps you've never made a Christian commitment. We want to give you that opportunity today. Just a few easy steps. First of all, recognize your need. The Bible tells us that in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners and must recognize our need for a Savior. By confessing our sins and turning from them, we will find forgiveness. The Bible promises in 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe in Jesus. God wrought a miracle when he sent his only son to die that we might have life. Put your faith in him and believe in his power to save you. The Bible says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God has given us a great gift in his Son, but we must receive this gift. Thank him for loving and forgiving you and ask him to live in your heart. His promise to us is clear. In John 1.12, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus is the atonement, the sacrificial lamb, the remission of sins, just as if we'd never sinned, and the forgiveness. Through Jesus, we have daily forgiveness. And having received his salvation, confess your faith. The Bible assures us in Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, we're all going to die and spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. We want to give you the opportunity to pray with us today. Let's bow our head. Lord, I recognize my need for you as my Savior. I confess my sins to you now, and I turn from them, and I ask for your forgiveness, Lord. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I receive you now in my heart, and I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you receive me into your kingdom. I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and that God raised you from the dead, that I might be saved and spend eternity with you. I thank you, Lord, that I am now part of God's family and I commit my life to you from this day forward. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer with us, we encourage you to share that with someone today. Thank you.